Hello, my name is Gustav Johansson and I run the biggest vegan food blog in Sweden. And this is my TEDx masterclass where I'll show you how the importance of retaining our food culture will be key into shaping the future of food. I am going to make the case that instead of taking all that food that we used to eat and throw it out and replace it with something more sustainable, what we should do and what we have to do is to upgrade the food that we love. I'm going to make an amazing burger with this impossible meat mince and with these vegan dairy ingredients. I'm going to make you an amazing milkshake that's going to hopefully show you what's possible and what's to come. As you can see, I'm not making patties directly of the mince. Rather, I'm making balls, which we're going to smash into something called a smash burger, which is, to me, a central part of the modern burger culture. That's part of what we're going to talk about here today, how to make and to respect the culture which these burgers comes from. And that leads me into the whole theme of this masterclass. Because the thing is that what most people hear when I say we should eat less meat, it's not that we should eat less cows or less pigs. The things people hear are we should eat more boring food and less of these. And I can understand that people are put off by that because it's logical. And the whole thing is that people have a very hard time imagining how good food could be without meat. Because really, that's all we know. Most of us haven't experienced really tasty food without meat. There is actually a word for this. It's called the meat norm. It's the idea that meat is such a normal part of our diet that we don't even reflect of it. But the problem with this is that food that doesn't contain meat very easily gets stapled as abnormal. And that's a problem because it's absolutely not true. There is nothing saying that you can't take the dish, the experience of a dish, just replace a little bit of it, the part that might be problematic, and still retain the full experience of the dish. Let me start to show you what I'm talking about. This, this is impossible mince. Might be the most advanced form of vegan fake meat that's out there today. The thing is, it contains the same thing that makes blood red. The only thing, it's not extracted from a cow, is actually extracted from the root of a soybean. And this is what uh, technology is possible to do today. You can take elements from meat, remove it or identify it, and then see if we can retrace it and recreate it by some means and somehow with plants. So if you look at what's happening when we put this down into the pan, the things that makes us love meat are not exclusive for meat. The things that we love is the Maillard effect. It's the reaction where the proteins and the carbs and the fat crystallizes and sweetens and gets transformed into something filled with umami and flavors. It's the fattiness that carries the flavors. It's the textures that gives you the proper bite. And in this case, it's also that irony flavor from the heme, in this case extracted from a soybean, that gives you that right feeling of bloodiness almost. We'll take some more salt, some more pepper, and we'll add our cheese. And vegan cheese might not have come just as far as vegan meat right now, but it's going to be in just a couple of years. So in order to make this melt, we'll just add a little bit of water so that the steam will help melt the cheese. We'll take one of these and put on the other to make a double cheeseburger. And then we'll place it over here so it can rest. All right, the burgers are done. But before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about this. This is one of the most frequently asked questions that I get. Why do you, as a vegan, want to make food that look like meat. Even if it's possible, why would you? Isn't that the whole thing that you as a vegan want to transition away from this whole thing? And I'd like to, I'd like to give you an example of 
that I think really puts the finger on why food culture, in this case, the experience of the dishes are so important. If you take the amazing Netflix show, Chef's Table, it's an amazing show. I love it and I'm even a vegan. But the interesting thing with this show that showcases chefs from around the world is that it actually contains quite little cooking. Most of the program is focused on the chefs and their story and the part of the culture that they're in and how the food in some ways helps to show and lift up that culture. It's a program not really about food, but about culture and character. And to me, that's so very telling of the whole thing. Food today isn't just something that we eat to survive. It's one of the big identity markers, one of the big things that help us remember and retain who we are. And imagine if you took that show and then just took the meat out of it and said that all the things that contain meat you are no longer allowed to eat. Most people just look at the Mexicans with their uh, whole barbecued carnita sheep uh, that boil in their own fat and the Am American barbecue pigs that are smoked whole or that uh, Russian dude who's uh, raising uh, elks and moose just to eat their mules. That uh, might be a bit weird, but you need to see the context of the food, and the context of the meat. It's all about traditions and cultures. So it's so important to realize that's what we're actually messing with when we're messing with meat. We're not telling people, like I said in the beginning, to eat less cows. We're telling them to be less Mexican. And this is more or less what I've devoted my career to. I've been hell-bent, more or less, on trying to find a way to retain my own food culture. I was raised in a home with a father who was a farmer's boy, who was raised on a farm and cooked a lot of traditional Swedish classic foods when I grew up. Swedish meatballs and all of the rest. And to me, that was comfort. That's my traditions. That's my identity. And burgers to me, that's what I grew up on when I was out with my friends eating at uh, McDonald's or Burger King or whatever. And when I became a vegetarian, it was so important to me to see if there was a way to remain who I was. And I've seen in my career that the, this idea resonates with so many people. I'm actually today collaborating with one of the biggest burger chains in Sweden, Boss Burgers, to make it possible for people that might not even have reflected on the possibility to eat the same thing as they would normally eat, but more in a more sustainable way in the same place where they would eat the less sustainable burger. The fact is that a beef burger has 12 times the climate off print as a vegan burger. 12 times. The thing is that to me, this burger represents the same idea as I can see Elon Musk doing when he launched Tesla. Yes, and I'm kind of com <laughs> comparing myself to Elon Musk right now, but I I'm sure you're going to get the point. He realized that in order to get people to stop driving fossil based cars, you can't give people bikes. Most people they have way too much going on in their life. They need to take the kids to football practice. They need to pay their bills. They need to get to work. They need to make all those little things that make life go and work smoothly just happen. Thinking about the climate crisis in that way that you should buy all your clothes secondhand, you should take your bike everywhere, you shouldn't eat meat, you shouldn't travel, all of those things kind of gets too much for people. And I know it, I realize it. And the thing is, Elon Musk realized that as well, that in order to stop people from driving bad cars, you can't give them a bike. You need to give them a better car. And the thing is, the way to do that is to take a really good car and then replace the one part of it that's bad. And this part, the fossil fueled engine and replace it with something better, a battery. Or in this case, we take the bad part of the burger, that is the beef, and replace it with a better part, that is plant-based 
meets. But what Elon realized as well is that it isn't enough to come with a good car with a battery in it. In order to push the change in the direction it's needed and do it fast enough, you need to come with a really amazing car. Faster and funnier and more good looking than any other car. And this is where the future of food comes in. These kind of plant-based meats, they are becoming better than meat. This might be one of the first iterations of something that's quite like in resemblance to meat. But this, in opposite to cows or pigs or chickens, this is an invention. And inventions iterate on a competitive market. This has a production cycle of one to two years and you're going to see a new iteration of it, a new version of this plant-based meat or of this plant-based drinks or of these plant-based mayos or whatever we're doing today. They're only going to get tastier and cheaper and more safe and more efficient to produce and they are going to revolutionize the way we produce meat and food today. All right, for our milkshake, we need ice cream. We add some raspberries and then we take our sprout, which is a pea drink, Swedish peas. We put it here and then we mix it. If we're going to make most people attracted to this change that we need to create in order to be able to save our planet from this destructive way we today are growing and creating our food, we need to make this something that is part of our cultural norms. We need to take the meat norm, throw it out the window and say normal food doesn't depend on meat.